Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Levi. I'm from the company called Acera. I founded the company in 2016, 2017. And I'm going to go through kind of how do we scale blockchain technology? Because we all like to kind of use blockchain technology, but we have like two kind of versions of blockchains, right? We have the permissionless, and we have all these issues with scalability, the kind of performance is degrading with the number of validators and miners, and we have the permissioned versions that are actually too small sometimes. So I'm gonna be a little bit brutal at times because I think we're kind of having like a little bit of a kind of crypto tribalism between kind of the intranet versus the internet, but the internet needs to scale as well. So let, 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 let's, let's go over everything. Uh, also, I'm very approachable, so if I see that people squint, I understand they don't understand me, or feel free to ask me questions. So I actually believe that we shouldn't have very monolithic designs of blockchains. I believe that we should actually separate to different layers. And I think that we are gonna grow stronger as a community if we are gonna approach the problem in a way that enables multiple vendors to contribute to our solution. And I'm gonna go over and prove it in the last 28 minutes. But I just wanna talk about the fact that if we're gonna think about like a single vendor that takes it all, we're all gonna lose. So how did we get there, right? So blockchain 101, just a quick kind of version of what's going on, right? So blockchains are becoming foundational, right? In many multi-party interactions. We wanna have a trusted layer. We wanna be able to have auditing, to see what's going on there, and basically have some trust. The problem that we see is actually, I don't think, I never believed that there will be like one version. Like I didn't believe that we we're gonna have, even though I worked on Bitcoin, like very early on, I worked as a chief product officer for Miro, a company that actually, you know, with Joseph Poon and Taj and Dominic Williams, and it's kind of a very famous company, but at the time, you we were trying to do like radical inclusion, but it was clear that we cannot put everything on Bitcoin, okay? And then Ethereum came up a little bit later and many, many more chains to go, right? So the main problem that we have today is that all these blockchains, permissioned or non-permissioned, are still being deployed in silos, okay? So that's, that's, that's how it started, right? Adoption is growing, a bit more accelerating. We see more people around here. You know, it's actually, it's going, getting a little bit out of control like when I talked about Bitcoin, people thought I'm crazy. When Vitalik walked on Ethereum, people thought he's crazy. Now you look at Libra, you look at IBM, you look at all these companies and, and all the money that is gonna put in there already and is about to come. I don't think it's gonna be an easy game if we don't build some layers with standards. So yeah, we have the permissionless, we have the permissioned, and we still have this issue that layer one blockchain projects don't talk to each other, right? Whether you are IBM, Enterprise Ethereum, Alliance, R3, or Ethereum, Bitcoin, Classics, Future, Next Gen, Previ Gen, I think we cannot have like 20 wallets to interact with a few chains. It doesn't make sense. Like what I really want, just to be kind of, I want one browser for every website. I don't want a browser for every single site, right? So. We have an issue with kind of a lot of regulations, uh, issues with trust, People don't really want to put everything on a chain, which is a good start, because we don't want to download the history. You know, before me, Vitalik was talking about hybrid solutions. Before that, Joseph Bruno was talking about how difficult it is to kind of join the Bitcoin network and how the size is increasingly, you know, growing and it's becoming just more expensive. So, oh, is it moving automatically or is it just me being so loud that the slides just shift? So how did I get there, right? So I've done a lot of stuff in crypto. Um, kind of worked in the military, did a lot of stuff with cryptographic proofs, uh, zero knowledge proofs, I kind of dropped out of a PhD, worked on access control in Cisco systems, certified cryptographic modules, so it was very low level FIB certification, kind of to agree with NIST. I've done a lot of stuff in finance, so I spent almost 10 years in finance, so Goldman Sachs, Barclays Capital, credit derivatives, a lot of stuff that requ requires a lot of compliance, and I'm trying to combine it now, right? So uh, I spend a lot of time in the financial sector. I understand kind of how banks think, work, risk manage, and I'm trying to bring that kind of to this space. So it's not clear like what, 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 if we should adopt to the way the bankers think or banks should adopt to the new technology. I think we need to find 
a way to communicate because we need liquidity, we need some financial kind of sectors or, 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 or institutions to come in with the real money and the real play because we are not going to have liquidity without it. At the same time, we really don't want one party or even 10 parties to control our networks, right? So kind of th there is a big fight between freedom and actually some consolidation in terms of institutional money coming in and regulations. Okay, no questions yet? Fine. So, you know, we all started with, oh, scaling is very easy. You know, what's the problem with scaling? You know, just don't put everything on the chain. Okay? This is what we started with, like, Bitcoin, right? And Lightning was, okay, let's just have some side channels and let's have payment channels that are separate, and I don't need to put everything and wait for all the miners to validate, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just going to zoom in to show how difficult it is, even in one of the layers that I presented. Okay, so when we started, I actually worked with Vitalik on, 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 on a Stanford class, the first uh, cryptocurrency class with Dan Bonet. It was 2015, it was the first version, and this is how we started. We called the company Acera because we worked on a module that basically has an architecture of a hash commit reveal. So I'm gonna hash something, I'm gonna commit it to a chain, and then later on if there's a dispute, I can always show the pre-image, and that's gonna be like the dispute resolution. So think about, a very simple use case. I have a large PDF, which is a contract. I'm going to hash it, and the other party is going to hash it. And we are both going to agree that this is the version, this is the hashed version. We'll commit it to a chain, and then we can forget about it. If there's any dispute, any of us can pull the PDF, show that this is the hash, and there you go. Okay, that's where the idea, right? So it's a very naive scaling solution that we just put hashes on a chain. So, you know, a real world example is we have KYC, let's try to share it, right? So we can just put hashes of the identities, then we don't have to worry about GDPR, it's very simple for me to scale, you know, and everybody was talking about, I have a customer, I'm gonna have like an easy KYC portal, I have a fulfilling bank, somebody is paying for the KYC, the other guy is using the proof, and then I can delegate it and share it with other banks so we don't have to go to Equifax every transaction, right? Or every time I wanna get a loan, from 40 different banks. That's kind of the use case. So we thought, okay, that's actually very easy, right? We just need to consolidate. So we're gonna have a consolidated developer environment for every company. We're gonna have a unified process. All the networks are gonna have service discovery. So we were trying to think about how we share the KYC across these different networks. It's easy for the developer. It's easy for each company. And we're gonna have just networks that, you know, everybody is just singing the Kumbaya. Um, some issues, regulations, right? So compliance, security, KYC, AML, uh, all the privacy stuff, GDPR came in a bit later, but we already knew that it's coming. So we were thinking, oh, let's just use some zero knowledge proofs. So when I started talking about zero knowledge proofs, it was kind of, when I was very young, and it was many years ago, and it was not even cool. Uh, there were a few kind of easy proofs about range proofs and very primitive versions of set membership. And I'm gonna talk about like, you know, you see a lot of development in zero knowledge proofs these days, but basically there is a little bit of a miracle in the middle and you know, like the, 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 basically the, the, the underlying of this cartoon is can you, can you elaborate a little bit more about that, that phase? And you know, so we kind of started modeling, right? So we have a few committing peers and we're gonna take a proof. And basically, if you think about like, it's a very similar way to the way Plasma works. So I have a proof of the main chain, I have parachain. If you look at Polkadot, they're using something similar. If you look at ZKVM, there are many, many constructs today that I'm gonna put some version of a hash commit, you know, on a chain, and only when I have a dispute, I'll be able to look at it, or I'm gonna do a lot of stuff in, in side chains and basically have maybe a proof of proofs, like what Coda is trying to do, or if you look at Stackware, they're trying to basically have a DEX, which is a used circuit, and then I'm gonna compress it and put just one proof in case of a dispute, right? So I don't wanna have every transaction, every dispute on a chain. But, okay, which one? So these are the versions that you have today. There's actually more, and just over the last two days, we see like three more variations, right? So it's actually not so easy to just add zero knowledge proofs in a similar way that it's not easy just to use TLS. We need to have like the full kind of end-to-end -end standardization so that people can read these proofs, others can validate these proofs, 
some hardware vendors can optimize these proofs. There's a lot of kind of economic value in actually standardizing stuff, right? So even a very simple kind of hash commit reveal scheme, if we're not gonna collaborate and we're not gonna have multiple vendors, we're just gonna lock each other in. And I don't think that this is the way, kind of, this is not how we're gonna get the light. So a few things that I actually really liked. We sponsored zkproof.org, which is a community version of let's standardize zero knowledge proofs. Uh, Anna Rose, there are a few people that are working with the community just to share, just to educate, just to teach. And one example of um, a, a product of ZK, ZK Proof, for example, is a ZK interface. Community-based standard that you can write to that interface and get all those lib snacks working well, the hardware below. You can take a look, but this is just one example of something that we have done within one year. Sometimes there's very big players, sometimes without. But if you look at around the table, there's Microsoft Research, I'm there, Mike here from R3, so even permission, non-permission, we're sitting together really trying to get some specs out so that other people can participate. Um, let's talk about like the bigger problem, right? So identity and zero knowledge proofs and some GDPR, that was supposed to be the easy part. So basically, what do we wanna do, right? Why do we have these blockchains? So usually, we want to tokenize some asset and to allow people to transfer that kind of, let's say between even two parties, right? Alice and Bob want to transfer an asset and I want to make sure that there's no double spending, I know what I'm buying, uh, there's no deniability, right? So there's no non-repudiation, so somebody sold something, he cannot claim that he didn't sell it, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, if you think about it, there's a lot of work to move from physical to digital. And I'm gonna talk more about standardization and why we need it, but think about like digital identity all the tokenization of an asset. How do I know that a tokenized asset actually represents a real asset? So I bought a certificate that tells me that I actually now owe a car to somebody else or I own something new. How do I know the provenance of that certificate that that car is really the car or that, I don't know, can is actually a tuna? You know, I need to know what I'm buying. So it's not so easy to digitize and this is where people argue whether kind of blockchain is useful at all outside the Bitcoin world, right? Because in Bitcoin, by the way, which is a full working live version of a financial system that really doesn't require intermediaries, right? So Bitcoin is working as a financial model. So everybody told us, oh, we need central banks. No, we don't always need central banks, right? But for Bitcoin, blockchain works because I generate the asset by solving some riddle, right? So I know exactly what is the tokenization. Like I know exactly what is the underlying. It's very clear to me what I generated. I don't have it with the real world, so it's not that easy to go and print certificates that represent real stuff. Uh, digital fiat, of course, we still need it, if anybody uh, forgot. And we have all these kind of issues with design and security and hacks and governance, you know, all the things that are actually very difficult problems, but I feel that many projects are stuck with the same issues, right? So all, all, all these layers, you know, do you really have a business model that doesn't rely on the token quadrupling once a month? Okay, because that, that's not sustainable. Do we really have a governance model that is sustainable? You know, if you think about TCP IP, if you think about the internet, if you think about the OSI layers, right? It took a while to kind of get there, but you know, after a while, the internet is working, right? It's not the same version of 1970s or the 80s, but now there are so many stakeholders to make sure that the internet is working, and there are so many sanitizations and improvements all the time, and I really want us to get there, right? I want us to get into a healthy competition where we're all fighting to improve our lives kind of in a way, right? But our networks as well. Um, so I think we need all of this. We cannot have just, you know, a little bit of fiat, some digital tokenization, a version of a digital identity. I think we need all of it. We, can't, we need like a full end-to-end -end system and the whole notion of I have one wallet that works with one network sometimes or it takes me two and a half weeks to get a full node in sync, it's not sustainable. It doesn't make sense, okay? Um, okay, next. So basically, everybody was telling, look, that's just the beginning, right? We just started, we have the network, 
if you talk to like Vlad Zamfi, or Vita, you know, they'll tell you, this is not ready for production yet. Why are you building all this stuff on top? You know, we're still working on it, right? So if you think about it, I just feel that we are like still here, where we actually need to be kind of here, right? We actually want to have like the phase two of a hybrid model where you'll be able to basically plug in to all the networks, download tokens, verify transactions, look at what you're getting, and actually switch within like your one browser, just like you do on the web, right? I don't necessarily have one browser for every website. I go to CNN.com, and then I go to, I don't know, Yahoo.com with the same browser. I even have tabs. So that's, it's the same idea, right? And I actually, so I'm gonna tell you about like some other things that I think that we really have to get to in order to kind of start using blockchain at scale. I think this approaches to different levels and people need to make sure that we have components that actually work, right? So I'm very happy to work with a settlement layer that is completely separate from my chain. Like I don't, you know, there's all these arguments. I don't think that ETH is money. You know, I think that ETH allows you, I can pay gas, I can use stuff, I can have programmable money in a sense that I can do some conditional kind of things that will happen if this or that. But I don't think that ETH itself can really, at the moment, be used as, as a currency. It's not stable enough, it's not fast enough. There are so many issues that are there. But we already have some settlement layers. And I'm not saying let's use SWIFT, necessarily. I'm saying think about the options. Today I have a lot of different options for settlement, okay? Infrastructure. We don't have one cloud provider. I don't have one network carrier. I don't, I don't use only AT&T or T-Mobile, right? I can work across different infrastructures and I can choose and I can move around as I please, right? Logic. I think that we are locking everything into one chain and it's not great. Like, I don't like Solidity that much. I really like Ethereum and the Ethereum community. I really don't like Solidity. So, but if I want to work today with Ethereum, I know that we are changing. I know that we have an assembly coming and, and, and the whole community is working on, on changing things, right? But today I still have to use Solidity if I want to run smart contracts on Ethereum, which I don't really like. Okay, so I would like to have options. I would like to use Ethereum, but I would like to have a different smart contract language. So DAML is a good example of digital asset that has kind of a generic markup language that allows you to model digital assets and they have a parser and it can plug in to different chains. So why do I need to lock my logic to the infrastructure, to the settlement? And I didn't even start talking about identity and privacy. I think that privacy solutions should also be separate. I don't like it that everyone that has like one idea on ZK, ZK proof with some different circuit, or I don't think that we need another chain for every single trick in the book, you know? Because we have to build the whole stack again. We have to have different wallets, we have to have different explorers, you know, and I'm not saying the Kitty Explorers is not an active explorer, it's just we're wasting a lot of time. We're wasting a lot of effort, you know? We should try to think about some way to represent a set of transactions or to display a block and to have a blockchain explorer with an interface and, and forget about it. And maybe we'll have a few explorers, but I don't want to build the full stack every time somebody comes in with yet another slight consensus algorithm that is a little bit better, and, and it's probably great. But think about what if we have a pluggable consensus model, and then we could find like five different things, and then we can run and test them all and, and compare them. Not to kind of have apples and oranges. I would really be able to plug in stuff and check and pay for the better service. That, for me, is a much better competition. Um, so we spend a lot of time on, on creating yet another kind of network of networks, right? So we have something called the Unbounded Network. Uh, I'm not gonna promote it too much, but I'll just say that this is much more enterprisey because we work with multiple clouds. So we could have the IBM cloud connected to the Microsoft cloud, connected to the Oracle cloud, but actually we allow you to also move data around from events on Bitcoin, Ethereum, to permission chains. But that's the reason I'm bringing it up, because to be honest, at this market, it's a nightmare. In order for us to keep up a clean interface to all these layers, when all the underlying are changing, forking, fighting, you know, upgrading, smart contracts are moving, it's just very, very expensive to maintain that kind of duck, you know, like to, to, to pretend that above the water everything is okay, but underneath we have to always upgrade the network just to keep the same API on top. Um, I'm just thinking that at some point we will have to 
kind of all work together because some people will work with Stella, or they will have their own identity on another network. Uh, I really like Ethereum, so I'm going to bring it up again, but I think that we need to start interoperating in a way that is very easy for somebody to move assets around, okay? This is a slide that we put together maybe a year and a half ago, and that was the idea, right? To be able to have different networks, some permissioned, some permissionless, and to be able to move data around from financial services to global trade to consumer industry. Now, some people in the community don't like it that I work a lot with enterprise settings. At the same time, I really like to work in the open networks environments. It's just difficult to work in, in highly regulated environments without having all this privacy, KYC, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the combination and what, what we actually do well is we are able to take some top technology, for example, and I'm openly saying that, Zcash has amazing, amazing implementations of zero knowledge that is production ready, but it was not so ready for working in highly regulated environments. We worked with them, we took some stuff, and we actually implemented it in a much more kind of regulated environment. But I'm telling you, we need to see more of that. I would like to be able to take more open technologies and to bring them to real use cases and to bring more kind of, I don't know if it's financial services necessarily, but to actually allow people to trade assets, to add more liquidity, because without it, we are going to kind of fight over the same pool. And I have a slide that talks about it. I think we need to bring new money and new assets to the space. Otherwise, what are we not double spending? Like we really need assets, real assets. Um, this is an example of a decentralized attestation model that basically people were complaining that all these KYCs are very, very centralized, right? So I have to go to Equifax. So we kind of worked out a model where you are able to kind of go and get a node and you get an attestation that basically tells somebody that needs to know that you're over 21 or somebody needs to know that you are an accredited investor. I don't necessarily need to go to the same KYC provider. So we spend a lot of time building all this tech just to meet regulations. And I think now the environment, I think it's all out of control, right? When you see China, when you see Libra, when you see like all the permission chains with all this money, all the public chains with all this money, like I think we're doing very well, all of us as a community, in terms of like attracting fire. I would like us to use that momentum and to actually build stuff that works so that all they can rely on that, right? So this is just another example, okay. Um, a few things that I want to talk about in terms of the community. Um, a lot of things that we all kind of do and sometimes can indeed kind of go wrong, basically. So we made a lot of assumptions about adversaries, right? So we saw it with the DAO. We, saw, we made a lot of assumptions about the cost. So the gas calculation was wrong and some people abused it. They looked at the ratio of computation versus storage, et cetera, et cetera. People are making wrong assumptions about computing capacity. So you think that it's very expensive to kind of break some signature. If you look at kind of military grade security or if you look at like nation state security, I don't know what's too expensive. You know, if somebody really wants to put resources, they will break stuff. So post quantum is a thing, but I would like to actually do stuff in a much more reasonable way and I think I shouldn't worry so much about the government trying to break this stuff. I think we should worry about the usability so that, I don't know, my mom will be able to just send me some Bitcoin at some point. You know, that's kind of a dream. Um, actual runtime cost, I don't know if people appreciate how expensive it is to run a node. Like, really, like, you know, I want to save some transactions. Swift is not that expensive. And I'm not trying to promote Swift. I'm saying, like, if we are trying to decentralize, we need to think about what we're doing. Are we trying, and, and look, I have two heads, you know? Like I am a banker, I went to like good schools, and I can kind of, you know, it's very easy for me to join the Navy, you know? But at the same time, and I admit, it's much nicer to be a pirate. So, you know, I, I, I kind of jiggle between the nice technology that we are building for having open networks that are censorship resistant, but at the same time, I would like to see more actual real usage with real assets, with fintechs that are coming in and offering services like a stable coin, like a transaction of assets, like provenance, so that we have more assets in the space. Trust and governance. You know, many people, even today, 
still trust some model of governance that doesn't hold water. Like, I really think that even if you're an enterprise, or even if you're just trying to run stuff, and you don't mind having a minute service, you really need to kind of control who is voting. You cannot just have it all in one single cloud. You need to, even in cloud, even if it's like your IT, you have to have a multi-cloud solution. Google went down just recently. AWS says, you know, you can't rely and put all the eggs in one basket when all the nodes are there. You need some all the nodes that will keep sync and make sure that everybody's honest. So we can't do it this way. We need to really open up. And some chains actually have a lot of cloud support and a lot of miners from different regions. And I think we need much more diversity there. Uh, standards, or the lack of standards, I talked about it. Um, I'm gonna go back to this. And I wanna, st I have like a few minutes, and if anyone has questions, I'm happy to talk about. But I think that there are some questions that we really need to answer, because we are getting to a tipping point. If you look at so many kind of projects that, I'm sorry, but really pumped a lot of coins, the incentive model is really wrong. You know, like, we didn't do an ICO, I didn't want to run tokens, because I was worried that I'm going to manage the token value all the time, just because I don't want to lose, I want to win. And then I'm going to spend so much time pumping, networking, and I don't mind networking, I go to a lot of events, but I go to events to learn, and to communicate, and to collaborate. I don't go to an event to tell you, oh, dude, you have to buy my token, because you know, tomorrow. I, I don't think this is the right mindset, if we are building for a 20-year projection, right? So if you want to do like a short thing for like a year or six months, okay, maybe, I don't know, it's, it's a good strategy, but I don't know, I was a banker and I was handling a lot of money, I never felt that I should steal money. So I don't think that like investors' money is revenue, I don't think that crowdfunding is, is a joke. I think it's nice that as a community, we can pull together a lot of resources that were not easy to do in the kind of VC world. And the main question is, do we want to fight within a community for a market share? Or do we want to bring more people and educate them so that we grow the pie? Because at the moment, I see some projects that are actually fighting each other, like all these Ethereum killers. Okay, Ethereum has issues right now. We don't need to like kill it, you know? It's like getting like massively slow. It's very expensive. ETH2 requires some more work. You know, why don't we help Ethereum instead of building a killer? You know, let's see what we can use as a consensus algorithm that helps Ethereum. There's a lot of projects that are doing zero knowledge stuff, right? So Aztec is one, Zexi is one. There are many account-based kind of models that actually try to improve privacy just to help scaling. And Vitalik was talking about the layer two solution that is much more hybrid. I think we are all gonna go there. So I don't know, I would combine forces here, you know? Uh, lower barrier to entry. I think we have a huge issue that it's really expensive to join a network. Joseph Bruno was talking about like how expensive it is to actually join existing Bitcoin networks. And I think Trying to lock people in by not giving them the tools that they need, like a wallet or an explorer, and kind of make them invest in tooling, I don't think it's gonna scale like in the long run. You know, there are some companies that, you know, worked in non-standard way and they actually lost. If you look at Chrome and if you look at other browsers, they actually win by complying with standards. So I would like us to go there instead of like, I've already invested two million dollars on building an explorer and a wallet. Okay. But why do you build an explorer in the world? You know, do you have assets? Do you transact? Do you save money? Do you make money? Let's not forget what we came here for, right? Uh, transition cost. I actually think, and I know it's a naive way, and guys, I have been working in an enterprise space for quite some time as well, in addition to the open space, and many, many providers are really counting on the fact that it's going to be very difficult to basically transition to another chain or to another network. I don't think that even that is a sustainable model. I think we should allow people in and out of chains whenever they like, as they please. And I think that soon the flexibility is actually gonna bring more people to the space than lock the existing ones when they are not happy. So I think that in a year, and I know that I'm kind of very optimistic, but I think that in a year, we will see that the big projects that are actually focused, and I don't know if it's gonna come from China, if it's come from Libra, or if some of us will actually join forces to a consortium that actually works and not fight each other within the consortiums like we see today. I think that the guys that will actually build a few layers in a stack and will have layers that actually work and are reusable, I think that this is how we're gonna win. 
I don't think that we are going to win with the infightings. And yeah, it was nice. 2017 was amazing. I made some money. Other people made a lot of money. 2018, people were losing a lot of money. 2019, everybody is asking, say, what the hell am I doing here? So I would actually work together and try to build a full fled stack and call to action. We are hiring like crazy. All right. Thank you.